From the mysteries of the universe to the mysteries of the unknown, this is Mysterious Realms with Mr. Cyber. Here is your host, Mr. Cyber. Well, hello everyone. This is Elijah, a.k.a. Mr. Cyber, and welcome to Mysterious Realms. Today I have the honor of speaking with Howard Storm. A lot of you may have heard of Howard Storm um, due to his amazing near-death experience. I remember hearing Howard Storm when I was a child, his story, and it just completely fascinated me. Um, Many of you who don't know, Howard Storm is an American Christian minister writer and painter he is a former professor and chairman of the art department at northern kentucky university in 2000 he authored my descent into death which chronicles his near-death experience howard storm's near-death experience has been cited in literature on near-death studies and his book has garnered endorsements by gothic fiction writer Anne rice before it was acquired by doubleday and republished in 2005 Mr. Storm has retold his story on NBC's Today Show, The Oprah Winfrey Show, 48 Hours, The Discovery Channel, and Coast to Coast AM. Um, yeah, and the thing I remember with Howard Storm is his appearance on Unsolved Mysteries when I was a child back in 1997. And I'll never forget his story. And then I heard about him on Art Bell. And what's crazy is... In 1985, he had a crazy near-death experience that instantly transformed him from an atheist into a believer. So, it is my honor to have Howard Storm here with us today. So, Howard, I appreciate you being with us today. Um, So, I know a lot of people out there have actually heard your story uh but at the same time there are individuals that haven't um and with everything that we're going through nowadays a lot of our community and these young individuals growing up not all but a lot of them are not um focused on god or really don't hear much about god and they're lost essentially and it's um it's actually really sad seeing how the way culture changes. Um, I just want to ask you, uh, when you were younger, were you brought up in a uh, spiritual fashion or did you not believe in a, uh, a God per se? Um, I grew up in the fifties. I was born in 46. So, you know, going to Sunday school in the fifties and then, um, going to church through uh, the early part of the 60s and then I left the church. Uh, when I was 12 years old, I was like really into it. Um, Protestant church in New England and uh, I asked my parents this uh, if I was bad. my parents were like totally not spiritual religious at all. Zero. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, when I was 12, I asked my parents if I'd been baptized and they said, no. And I said, I want to be baptized. So, um, I got baptized as a 12 year old because I wanted to. Um, but by the time I was 15, um, I was so disillusioned with my family because I thought church was just a big act of hypocrisy. Yeah. And it was, and I didn't, <laughs> I didn't have to use much of a, uh, imagination to think that. I mean, it, it, it clearly was. It was just cultural. Yeah. We went to church because what people were supposed to do on Sunday, but they didn't. Um, they didn't um, practice it or believe in it, or they didn't even want to be involved in it any more than just. I mean, a lot of times they just dropped us off. But the Sunday school teachers were great because um, they were really sweet women. They were all women, and um, yeah. we had lots of arts crafts, which I loved, and. Um, they, they related to us. Um, and, you know, there's an old saying that faith is um, contagious. It's not taught. You you know, you, you catch it from somebody. And so that's where I was getting my um, understanding of God. But I was so, um, this, I'm, now I'm talking like the early 60s, so, dis- so uh, disillusioned with uh, my family, with the church and religion. And I started reading philosophy. I was very precocious and um, 
went from um, you know Plato and Aristotle to Descartes and Kant, and then eventually came upon the existentialists. And that um, I bought existentialism hook, line, and sinker. In case um, people don't know, it's totally atheistic. Martin Heidegger, Jean Paul Sartre, um, Albert Camus, the novelist, was a big uh, proponent proponent of uh, existentialism. So, anyways, by the time I was fifteen, um, I had given up on religion. I had stopped going to church and um, I thought I was way smarter than religion. Mm-hmm. Wow. So I can tell from reading your whole bio, things have changed since then up to now. <laughs> Dramatically. Dramatically. Because you went from um, kind of that experience to all the way going up to becoming, correct me if I'm wrong, but you became a pastor later in life. Yeah, that I mean, nobody that knew me up until my experience would have ever <laughs> dreamed that I would become a pastor because I was an outspoken atheist and I was a university professor and all of my friends, all of them were all university faculty. Yeah, and the people. I'm out with we're all atheists and we used to um, spend an inordinate amount of time making fun of um, Christians and religious people and when I say making fun of them, I mean in, in um, the cruelest possible way because um, the, the nice thing about um, being an atheist is um, I, I don't know if this is true for all atheists but it certainly gives you a sense of superiority because um, you, you you're so cynical, you're so skeptical of everything. Mm-hmm. You don't you don't believe in anything except basically yourself. Um, I like to uh, tell atheists that they've got a great religion. Their religion is um, their their own god, and that makes them very angry. And I don't know why, because it's true. Oh, it's having absolutely a, true. Uh, having been one, um, I I know what I'm talking about um, in terms of atheism and uh, being your own god. Um, is a great religion because you can do whatever you want to do and you get to change your mind <laughs> you know, whenever you want to well, because that's being ex- God, you, you know. <laughs> that's ex- you know what? It's, 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 it's a laughing thing, but at the same time, it's really sad, unfortunately, you know? And it's because when I, you know, don't get me wrong, I know a couple atheists. They are very humble, nice individuals, but I can see it yeah. that, that they're lost yeah. and it's obvious. Yeah. They're lost. Well, you know, the the reality is, and I mean this um, emphatically, the reality is the religion of the United States of America generally is materialism. It's not Christianity. It's not atheism. It's not anything. It's materialism. People's God is stuff, yeah. matter. That is the religion of the United States of America. And I... And I said Christians as well as atheists. Um, there's many, many people that call themselves Christians, but their their religious practice is materialism. That's what they live. Yeah, um, that's correct. Um, and it's a uh, so, but um, as I'm not saying this as an apologist for Christianity. I'm just saying this as. Uh, someone, I, I was a pastor for 30 years, um, and I love the church, and I love the people in the church, but um, church people are no better than any other group of people. I, I say if you went to the grocery store and rounded up everybody, all the shoppers in the grocery store, mm-hmm. um, they'd be no better or worse than the people that go to church. The only, the only difference is, theoretically, the people at the grocery store are pursuing groceries, and the people at church are pursuing the mystery of God and hopefully seeking a relationship with God. Yeah. But I mean, there's, there's really bad people in the church and there's saints in the church and there's everything in between. And, um, the, 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 the corny old expression, the church is not a museum of saints. It's a hospital for sinners. You know? Well, that's a perfect analogy. I mean, that's absolutely right. And yeah. now that you think about it that way, it makes complete sense. You know, I've never thought about it like that. So I appreciate you putting it that yeah. way. I'll tell you, 
something that I learned at church. Some of the people that you think are the really great church people, the pillars of the church, the upstanding Christians in the church, when you get to know them, you find out they're deeply flawed human beings. Yeah. Some of the people that you think, well, they're pretty lukewarm. They don't, they're not very interested in this stuff. You know, they're, they're not, you know, strong members of my church. When you get to know them, you find that they have an un- unbelievable deep faith. You know, and are very, very loving, kind people. So, anyways, the point is, is that um, as a pastor, what I discovered was I didn't know what these people were really like, and it took me a long time to even begin to get to know them a little bit and where they were in their um, spiritual journey. Yeah. You know? Now, if I can ask you, Howard, and I'm probably like the millionth person to ask you this, okay? And um, I'll, I'll let you, I'll let you describe it how you want. What led you down this path? Um, June first, nineteen eighty five, at the end of a three week art tour of Europe with uh, my students. At eleven o'clock in the morning, it was a Saturday. I had a perforation of the duodenum, which means um, I blew a hole out in my small stomach, mm-hmm. and it knocked me to the ground with the most uh, acute pain I'd ever experienced in my life. I was on the ground, thrashing, screaming, cussing, yelling, in absolute terror. Because it was like one minute I was talking to my wife and a student, and the next minute I was on the ground in this indescribable pain. And uh, long story short, my wife called the... um, hotel desk, they called an emergency medical service. Um, a doctor came within about 10 minutes and he was very nice and he got me off the floor with a great deal of effort and knew immediately what was wrong. He told me that I had to have surgery within the hour or I would die. He called an ambulance and they came and they carried me, put me in a chair and carried me literally, um, out of the hotel down the steps and everything, put me in an ambulance and we went um, um, at a very high rate of speed in the (laughs) ambulance. And the thing was like, you know, um, you know, felt like it was going to flip over as we went around the corners and everything with the siren blasting and stuff like that. And uh, it was very dramatic. And um, took me to the emergency room of the big city hospital in Paris where I was examined by two more doctors. They said exactly the same thing that the doctor at the hotel said, perforation of the duodenum, and that if I didn't have surgery within an hour, I would die. So they sent me from emergency uh, several blocks away on a gurney to the surgical hospital. This is the big uh, public hospital of Paris. Mm -hmm. Um, the Hospital General de Assistance to Public de Paris. And because it was a Saturday and because of socialized medicine and the summertime and all that, I didn't know it, and I know the doctors in emergency didn't know it, but there was no surgeon um, on duty or available at the surgical hospital because it was a Saturday, and they work Monday through Friday. Well, you know what? I don't mean to interrupt you, Howard. I do remember hearing that part of the story, and I was blown away that there was no one available to help you at that time. That shocked me. It is pretty shocking. Um, I've uh, Some people in Europe have sent me other stories of other people that have suffered um, neglect at that very same hospital. Okay. People who died in the emergency room waiting to see a doctor and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. anyways... Ask anybody that's had, ask anyone who's had medical care outside of the U.S., and they will tell you um, the U.S. is the best by far. That's that's why so many, anyone who's wealthy in the world that can afford it comes to the U.S. Oh, absolutely. For, yeah, at, at at Duke University Hospital, there's a whole building built by Saudi Arabians. <laughs> <laughs> So that they could go to Duke University and get American medicine. That's amazing, isn't it? 
Yeah, and they're, and they're the, you know they're some of the richest people in the world. I mean, they could they could have good medical care in Saudi Arabia, but it's not as good as what we have here. You know. <laughs> wow. Well, we are blessed okay. when it comes to that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So you finally got a surgeon then? Well, ten hours later. Oh my goodness. Um, Prior to that, I was given no medication. I was never seen by a doctor. Nobody took my blood pressure, my temperature, anything. I was put in a room to wait for a doctor to see me. Um, every doctor I've talked to in the U.S. said it's a miracle you're alive because you only had a very short time to live. Yeah. And the fact that I lived an hour was like, they said, that's inexplicable. They can't explain it how I did that. Um, and, um, I did get, uh, some, uh, reports from the French doctor who operated on me and stuff like that. And, um, so the American doctors, I mean, know from the French doctor that I'm not making this stuff up. I mean, yeah. Anyways. So, um, I, uh, they, uh, because of the, um, stomach acid and enzymes and bacteria migrating into my abdominal cavity, I became extremely septic, Yeah, extremely septic. And so, um, God spoke to me at the French hospital after I'd been there a few days and told me that I had to go home or I would die in that hospital. So, um, we left the French hospital and I was very, very ill. And I got on a plane and came home to Kentucky and went into my local hospital. And I was immediately diagnosed as uh, two collapsed lungs, double pneumonia, um, extremely septic, and um, very little um, liver function. Oh my gosh, Howard! And I was on—I was put on critical, and I stayed on critical for five weeks. And um, who criticals? Critical means that you um, may die any minute. Oh yeah, yeah. So I was, I was I was sick for a long time, and I had to have more surgery and stuff like that. So the recuperation took months. So I got a quick question for you, Howard. So when you were in that state, and um, do you recall? I, I know you were atheist in a way, um, but did you start thinking about you know what if something happens to me? I want to know if there is a God. I mean, did that go through your head at that time at all? Nothing. Um, I, I died. The part that I skipped in my telling you the little, um, medical part of the whole thing yeah. was I, I skipped the big event, the big event in my life. I consider it the most important thing that's ever happened to me in my life. Um, I died and, um, I was taken to hell and I can describe all this in great detail, but right now just give, just give you the brief outline that, yeah. um, in hell, I mean, it was horrible. They, they tore me apart literally. It was very painful. And after they were done with me, um, I prayed. Now they were leaving me alone cause I was no longer amusing them. Yeah. And um, I went over my life, and I, the, to put it simply, I couldn't figure out why was I ever born. What what was the reason for my existence? Mm-hmm. Because although I was a egotist and an alpha male, and um, I was very successful in my career as an artist and as a uh, I was the department head of the art department at the university and all this stuff, making really good money and I had a wife and two kids and all this stuff. When I went over my life, it was like, but what was it all for? Because, you know, I I wasn't famous. I wasn't rich. I wasn't important. I I mean, I wasn't, I was just a little nothing in a little nowhere school in Kentucky and, you know, um, you know, problems with my family, problems with my kids, problems with my wife, you know. Well, did you ever feel like you were lacking something deep in your soul? Oh, <laughs> put it, uh, put, put it, that's putting it mildly. One of the 
like um, Friday, Saturday night, or both, I always go out with my buddies, and we'd go drinking until two o'clock in the morning when the bars closed, and then we'd go get hamburgers after that, you know, and <laughs> BS each other for hours um, until five, six o'clock in the morning, and then, you know, go um, wandering home. And uh, I used to terrify myself because I always wanted to commit suicide. Um, my my thing driving home, and I knew it was going to happen, and it, and it happened very frequently. It's like, what is the? There's no point to any of this. Why why am I living? I just um, I just put the uh, accelerator down to the floor and drive into that uh, the next bridge abutment, or just drive off that hill into that you know over the cliff. I mean, yeah. What's the What's the point? Nothing. Nothing. Brought me any kind of um, real joy. I I sought pleasure all the time, mm -hmm. and whoever's listening can take that for wherever their imagination wants to go because I did it. All right. I mean, I was a hedonist. I sought gratification of the flesh. Okay. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have to spell it out any more than that, do I? Oh, well, a um, lot of people can relate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately. And, uh, the, the thing that was sad is that, you know, there'd be pleasure, uh, a momentary pleasure, and then afterwards it was like, so what was that? Who cares? You know? Yeah. Now, now I'm me again. You know, it's like it's, the adventure is over. Yeah. Well, you know, well, you know what? Going back to when you died for that period of time, yeah. it shows you all that stuff is irrelevant. Yes. It has no bearing. It has no meaning on anything in the end. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I'm a human being. I like to be comfortable. You know, like um, when I go to bed, I like to be warm in my bed, you know, and have a nice pillow and, you know, right. Um, <laughs> In the, in the summertime, you know, we got to turn the, uh, close the windows and turn the air conditioning on. I do, I do enjoy comfort. I'm a human being, but, um, living your life for pleasure is absolutely empty. It, 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 it just takes you from one emptiness to the next. Yeah. So the way I like to describe it is, is that, um, looking back at myself, there was a big, huge, empty, dark hole in the core of my being and I tried to stuff it with things mm -hmm. um, power money sexuality food booze drugs you name it I, I was stuff throw that stuff down the hole but it was uh, it was kind of like a black hole you know you'd throw your stuff in it and then it would just disappear and, this, and the black hole would only be blacker oh indeed yeah. yeah. So I just want to go to the uh, part real quick. So when you died, you experienced all these demons. You experienced the hell. Um, to get out of that, you said you started praying. Um, was it a certain prayer you were starting to pray? Did you remember something from your childhood that you just started to say? Um, uh, yeah. Um, the I. I was trying to, I, because my religious experience ended as a young adolescent, I thought praying meant you memorize things and then you recited them. That's what I thought prayer was. Yeah. Which, that can be prayer, but prayer is a whole lot more than that. I mean, that's, on, that's just the tip of the iceberg of prayer. Um, and so I was trying to, remember things and that was okay but it didn't get me anywhere it drove the people around me away from me the the these terrible people that were around me it, when i started mentioning god they couldn't stand it and they left me but the thing that worked the prayer that worked was i remembered as a child singing jesus loves me which is a song that any any kid that goes to church, even 
in other parts of the world. Um, everybody learn. I mean, everybody knows that song. Jesus loves me. This I know for the you know. Oh yeah, one. did we sing um, that when I was a child? I clearly yeah. remember that. Yeah, I, I, I've been in Africa and Europe and South America, and, and everybody knows that song. Yep. Anyways, I um, that song was the one. That was the prayer. That song that changed everything. That's when Jesus came to me and took me out of hell and took me to heaven and um, loved on me, gave me a life review and answered all my questions. Uh, okay. So, so when, um, I'll see, how can I say this? So did a hand reach down to you and like kind of grabbed you out of this pit per se? No, he he came. Oh, he came. In, okay. He came in his person and surrounded in glorious light and his hands reached down and picked me up and he made me whole, instantly filled me with his love and he put his arms around me and held me very tight up against him and I held on to him and cried out of joy wow. and slobbered all over him. And he rubbed my back. And I'm guessing and at that he, point you immediately knew who it was without even yeah. guessing. Oh yeah, I knew. And, um, and then we, we just left that place and we're traveling very, very rapidly through space. And I would like to submit we weren't just tra- traveling through space, we were traveling through dimensions because I don't believe heaven or hell are very far. I think they're just a different vibrational state, a different dimension. No, oh, of course. And uh, so um, okay. he, um, the one, one thing that I want people to know when I talk about Jesus is that he is the most likable, interesting, kind, funny, um, patient uh, being I've ever met in my life. And I love him, and I love him, and I love him. And more importantly, he loves us, and he loves me. Oh, indeed. Indeed. Yeah. You know, what What gets me is, you know, in I'll, I'll be honest with you. I was raised Catholic, and, uh-huh. um, you know, I knew how to pray and do all this stuff, but I didn't understand when they were talking about a personal relationship. And as I got yeah. older, I became a born again Christian and it finally clicked. I'm like, you know, Jesus doesn't want us to be like a robot. You know, he wants us to really talk to him because he's real, you know, talk yeah. to him. You know, he doesn't want you to sit down there and do repetitious prayers. Cause even I get bored of that. I'm like, talk to me, yeah. have a conversation. Yeah. I'm your friend. I'm your father. I'm your buddy. I'm everything. Yeah. And, and I, and I want to, um, uh, tag on to what you just said. Not only does he want to talk to us, but he wants honest talk, straight up talk, no BS talk, no games. Tell it like it is. If you're mad at him, tell him you're mad at him and tell him why you're mad at him. If you're disappointed, tell him why you're disappointed. If you're feeling, if you're feeling rude and ugly, give it to him. Give it, give him everything. There's a, there's a line in the Bible. All you who are um, weary and heavy burden, come unto me and I shall give you rest. Um, he, he will take your, your emotional dump and he'll know what to do with it. And he will repay you with love and kindness. If you're happy, talk to him. Um, (laughs) you know, (laughs) if you've got a question, ask him. I mean, he's, he's, um, very, um, accessible once you have a relationship with him, but you got to have a relationship with him. People, he, he's not a puppet on the string. You can't just pull his strings and he's going to um, drop the winning lottery number in your lap. Yeah. That ain't going to happen. Nope. You know? No, because that's all materialistic stuff, you know, yeah. and it's stuff our soul doesn't need. You know, it feels like we yeah. need that stuff. I mean, it can make everything all warm and fuzzy, but you know, it's funny. I know a lot of individuals, well, quite a few individuals that are beyond wealthy and you know what? Now, some of them are Christians, but some of them, who aren't you can just see it's like 
something's so obviously missing in their life. And yes. we don't try to force, you know, our beliefs on them, but what you'd want to do, we act it out. We show them how we act, you know, and it's just, if you don't force it on somebody, just show them love and compassion. And we plant yeah. those little seeds. You can't save somebody. Only the Lord can do that, but we can help plant right. those seeds and let him take yeah. it from there. And it's, I um, completely agree with you. well, yeah. And it's, um, now, here's one thing I'm always curious in, Howard. Um, the thing that fascinates me is the experience. So right now I'm talking to you over the phone, um, and I'm, I'm looking around at my desk right now, and, you know, it's real. It's, I'm not dreaming or nothing. How more real was heaven and hell versus the now? Well, that that's um, a great question because it's been hard – to communicate that to people. Our, our life experience is this world. Yeah. And so we call this world reality, which yeah, it, it's our reality. But when you go into the next world, I mean, some people call it the supernatural world or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, you, your, your um, faculties change. Like I noticed after I died that all of my senses, my five senses, were greater than they had been before. Um, I'm an artist, mm-hmm. and I was an art professor, and I used to teach almost every semester um, in basic um, introductory college art class. Um, how we see, and it's, it's well understood, our, our vision. We see three wavelengths of light because we have three cones that pick up three different wavelengths of uh, the little tiny bit of the electromagnetic spectrum called the visible light spectrum, Yeah. right? And um, <clears throat> I'm like going crazy in my near-death experience because like I'm seeing colors that I've never seen. And I'm trying to figure out which of these are primary and which are secondary and how do they relate to the, the three colors that the three primary colors that I know. And it's like, I I couldn't figure it out. And it was like, you know, mind blowing. You, you hear better, you smell better, you, you taste more, you feel more. I mean, it's just like, um, so you're in hyper reality, you're in super reality. And then, um, in my experience with Jesus, when he toured me around certain things like heaven and stuff. And, um, the, the laws of physics that hopefully we know and trust like gravity (laughs) (laughs) are not, I'm in space, not applicable anymore. Whole different, whole different, um, physical, uh, world. Yeah. And it is, I mean, it, it's spiritual, but it's also physical. I mean, it's, it's, you, you touch, you taste, you feel, you, you know, um, but you can move, <laughs> excuse me, through time and space without any effort, without any transition. You just do it. When I was with Jesus, um, I asked him a lot of historical questions and we would go back in history and we would be in historical events. I mean, we we were literally there, you know, experiencing it. Um, and we also went into the future and this was all, um, there's no transition, no effort. We just did it. But, um, the, the beauty and the glory of heaven is so spectacular. It's, um, indescribable and, um, so wonderful. And if you had, there's no time there, but if you had a billion, billion years to explore heaven, you wouldn't begin to um, know it all. That's but the amazing. main thing about heaven, the main thing about being with Jesus and being in heaven is how much we are loved. Because the, the bottom line is, and I'm just going to say this flat out, um, we all want to be loved. That's what every... Every human being I have ever met, they want to be loved. Now, some go about that in appropriate ways, 
and some go about it in very um, disturbing ways because they their experience of being loved was so um, abusive that they don't know how to express they don't know how to give love and they don't know how to receive love because they um, it's all been so their childhood was so um, distorted yeah. um, and the love that they received was so inappropriate. Um, one third of American women report that they were, um, they have been sexually abused as children. Mm. One third. That is a high yeah. number. Well, well, even one is too high, but one third yeah. that's higher than I even knew. Wow. Yeah. Um, and I can pretty much guarantee you that everyone that, uh, that molested them and abused them told them that that was love. Oh, that's sick. Right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. They're, um, what do they call it? They're like molding them in a way or, um, I forget what the term is, but yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. And it makes them feel like, okay, so this is normal. Yeah. Um, and it's frequently relatives that are doing it. Anyways, um, so heaven is real love and we're really deeply loved there. And it's so overwhelming. You don't, you don't have to defend yourself. You don't have to pretend you don't have to, um, be suspicious of people's motives. It, it's just so loving because I mean, this, this is a no brainer. God's love dominates heaven. That's what heaven's all about. It's like, that's God's home. That's God's place. And God's love permeates and dominates everything. And in that world of love, you can finally be who you were created to be in the first place. And that, that was one of the things that Jesus told me. He wanted me to come back to this world after he um, gave me my um, education, my awakening. Yeah. Um, said, you got schooled, just, essentially. <laughs> yeah. He said, I just want you to live the way God created you in the first place, to be the human being that God created you to be. And you know what? Um, I've been working on that for 35 years now. Um, I, I am far from perfect. Um, I'm a, I just put it real simple. I'm a sinner saved by grace. Um, Amen. <laughs> but I am working on trying to be the person that God created to me, which is to be, um, a kind person, a loving person, a, a patient person, um, you know, a, a giving person. I'm working on those things, but like, ain't no saint, you know, <laughs> oh, of course. I, I want to be a saint. I'm working. I'm I'm working on my sanctification, but I have not achieved it. <laughs> well, you know what? So, being a Christian myself, the uh, you know I'm I'm a sinner just as much as anybody else. And life, uh, see, here's how I look at it. There's a difference between you know sinning and doing all that. But as Christians or believers, we know we're sinners still. And yeah, I mean, we yeah. repent. Uh, we ask for guidance and to become stronger to overcome these sinful ways. But the sad thing is we're going to keep sinning, but it's a, it's a learning thing. You ask the Lord, Hey, I, you know, I'm going to need your help. I need your strength. Um, but the way Jesus I see is, you know, if we call upon him, he'll help us get through these things. It won't be easy. He wants us to work. Um, yeah. he's not going to do everything for us, but, yeah, even till the day we die, we're going to be sinners. Um, but yeah. but there's a difference between somebody acknowledging it and working on it, such as ourselves, versus those who just blatantly ignore it. Um, yep. I used to, um, from the pulpit, I used to say this in my sermons. Um, we're sinners like everybody else. The only difference is we know it and we're working on it, and they won't admit it, and they're not working on it. <laughs> That's the only difference. Well, yeah. Well, you know what? If I know I got Jesus in my field and I'm working on this stuff, you know, I got nothing to worry about because he has our backs as I, long as we're right. working on it, <laughs> you know, and yep. we're giving it what we can. Um, and that was the, that was the big problem with being an atheist is you're stuck in a rut. 
You know, if if you had talked to me prior to June 1st, 1985, mm-hmm. and said, Howard, you're a sinner, I would have been angry, and I would have told you off in no uncertain terms. I would have F-bombed you right, left, and up and down. Oh, yeah. You know, don't you call me a sinner. I'm a good man. I'm fine. I'm a college professor, you know. Oh, yeah. But yeah. now when someone calls you a sinner, you're like, no, I know. <laughs> because we know yeah. it. We we oh, acknowledge it. Yep. Yeah. Wow. So, so when you came back from this experience when you died, I'm guessing you were immediately changed and transformed just like that. Yes. Wow. But the but the main thing was is that my big dilemma was I knew I was going to have to remake my life, and the problem was I'd spent 38 years building Howard Storm. And now, like, what do I discard and what do I keep? What do I change? What do I modify? You know, um, and, it, and it was all, it, it was all work. I mean, it's like I used to smoke, I mean, before my experience, I smoked three packs a day. I was up I there. After the experience. <laughs> huh? Now I was going to say, I, I used to be up there at that number with you. <laughs> oh, okay. And I, and I knew after the experience, uh, the cigarettes are going to have to go. No, there's nothing evil about cigarettes. It's just a really bad habit. <laughs> you know, know. It's self-destructive. <laughs> and not only is it self-destructive, but it's also destructive to the people around you. Um, oh, yeah. You know, not good for anybody. So anyhow, well, you, you know, know what? Giving, giving up oh, cigarettes sorry. was like hard. Um, I, I will drink a beer or a glass of wine. And when I say one, I mean, I, I, I have like maybe one drink of alcohol a month Yeah, and I enjoy it. And that's all because I used to, um, my, part, part of my claim to fame prior to my experience was drinking people under the table. I had a capacity to hold my uh, liquor really well. I used to love to, um, um, competitively drink until the person um, that I was competing with um, couldn't stand up anymore. Oh my gosh! Laugh at him. Wow, that was some real drinking back then. Yeah. Wow. Well, you know what really gets me, Howard? When we started talking, you said one thing that really stuck out, and that was you didn't know why you were here. You didn't realize. Well, you didn't know. You know, like, why did God make me? Like, what's the point of all this? And my take is God wanted you to have this experience for a reason because look what you, yeah, you had to rebuild things, but look how much better things turned out and how much you got out there to citizens on all the shows you were on, et cetera, just to tell your story. This just didn't happen for no reason. There was a reason behind it. Yeah, I think think God's got a tremendous sense of humor. And he and God thought, now here's this like, you know, big mouth atheist, you know, um, I think I'm going to do a, a, a Paul on the road to Damascus number on him. <laughs> <laughs> and let's just see how that all plays out. You know, I bet God's like, oh, this going to be fun. <laughs> I, I, trust me, I'm not comparing myself to Paul, who's one of my heroes. I, oh, yeah. I, um, Paul, Paul is so great, and um, I'm anxious to um, get a little uh, Paul time when I go to heaven because I really want to talk to him because he's just so unbelievably courageous and brave. Um, but anyways, and faithful. But anyhow, um, I think Paul, I think God was like, <laughs> this guy... This guy might do his testimony. You know, one of the things that I've discovered as a Christian, lots and lots of people have wonderful, amazing experiences with God and with Jesus. But they are, for many, many reasons, um, embarrassed to talk about them. Mm -hmm. So to put it 
in um, church language. There's lots of great testimonies out there, but people don't give them because they're afraid people will make fun of them or ridicule them or not believe them. And, and believe me, I've had many, many people ridicule me and not believe me and make fun of me. And so, it, and that hurts. It's painful. Oh, it I mean, does. nobody likes to, but, um, there's, there's lots of testimonies out there. And I just, I just wish that, um, people that have had these experiences and, and I know they're there because they've told me as a pastor, one of the privileges was people would tell me this. I mean, I can't tell you how many times people said to me, I've never told anyone this before, or I told one person and they didn't believe me. So I never told anybody else, but pastor, I want to tell you something that happened to me. And they'd tell me these like amazing stories and I'd go like, yeah, yeah, that was God. That was Jesus. You know, you should, you should be, not, you shouldn't be hiding that. You should be like, you know, telling people about that. Cause that's, that's, that's how we encourage one another. Well, see, and you I know? think it's good what, well, it's not good what happened to you, but I think what God put you through is fantastic because think about this. You were put in that position where somebody who was holding back, who was afraid to tell about it, had you and they knew your story and they could approach you. And then once yeah. they felt comfortable and you told them, Hey, you shouldn't be, shy or embarrassed by that just i'm sure that brought a lot of relief to them like saying okay it's fine to talk about this subject um and if yeah. those think i'm crazy then you know what that's not my problem you know that's you know it's between me and the lord um and you know what um all of us and I'm, I'm including myself in this we all need to process these um um transformative, I like to call them transformative experiences. Mm -hmm. um, you can also call them mystical experiences or you know, some are near death experiences, whatever, whatever you want to call them. But um, matter of fact, I just got off the uh, phone a little bit ago with a really good friend of mine in Massachusetts, who's a psychologist who was a, um, um, he was both a professional psychologist, but very high up in the martial arts and, had an amazing experience with Jesus, which completely changed his life. And, um, uh, he's tried to tell people about it, but, um, he's gotten pretty discouraged about telling his story. Anyways, um, the, the people, people have experiences with God. People have experiences with Jesus. Um, it becomes our reality. And, we need to support and encourage not just believers, but also for the people who are like wondering if there is any meaning in their life, if there is any purpose in their life, if there is a creator, if there is a God, um, uh, was Jesus really, um, you know, what Christians say he was, was he really, you know, um, fully human, fully divine? Is he really, you know, part of God? I mean, you know, is any of that stuff true? Well, there are people, and I'd like to consider myself one of them who go like, yeah, that stuff's true. It's real. That is the reality underlying all this stuff. And I could tell you hundreds of stories where my faith has been affirmed by miraculous things um, that were gifts from God gifts uh, of healing, um, gifts of um, very large sums of money being given to me from complete strangers so that I could do um, mission work. Um, I just go on and on and on. But the most important gifts that I've been given, and this is a little... It's so emotional for me. It's a little hard for me to get this out because of my testimony being an encouragement to people. People have told me in person, told me on the phone, told me in emails, told me in writing that my testimony encouraged them to seek out Jesus, to seek out God. Wow. And now connected. And that's my big accomplishment in this world. No matter how much of a schmuck I am as a 
big shot in America, which I am not. I'm just a schmuck. I have helped people find their way to God. Yeah. Um, I didn't give them the faith. I encouraged them to ask for it. And that and that's how you get it. You ask for it. Yeah. Sincerely. That's absolutely that's like, right. It's, 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 you just you just you, you get down to the the core of your heart and you ask for it. And when you do, you're not going to be disappointed. No, of course you won't be disappointed. I mean, that's you know what? The end result is the good news. And being there for those folks and those individuals, that's uh you know, that's something to be happy about because when you see yeah. someone seek out the Lord, um, I mean, what else could you be happier about now? Ultimately yeah. God will come down and bring the Holy spirit into them. But once yeah. you start seeing those dots connect, man, that feels great. Just it's yeah. exciting. And, and you feel happy because you know, God's happy and he's like, all right. <laughs> and we know the I, devil's I wanna, mad. I, yeah. Yeah, I want to uh, make a plug for church. Oh, yeah, go ahead. First of all, I pastored churches for 35 years. There is nothing you can say critically about the church that I can't top with a bigger horror story. <laughs> <laughs> and every I, right now, um, almost most of my friends are all pastors, and um, I hang out with pastors and talk to pastors all the time, and and we all know what's wrong with the church. Um, and we all, and we all have our stories to tell of, you know, bad things that have happened. The church is made up of people. Correct. And they bring all their stuff to the church, but there is something wonderful and supernatural good about the church. And let me, um, give you a person because of the COVID thing, mm -hmm. um, I have not been able to attend church in, in person for a year. You know, we had our, my church was virtual and I, it just not the same. I mean, you know, my pastor did a really great job, you know, trying to do a, a virtual service, but anyway, it's not the same. But recently in the past few weeks, my church has started meeting. So this, um, we're talking, um, at the, um, at the end of Holy Week. So um, I was able to attend a Monday, Thursday service, Good Friday service, and Easter service um, in the last few days. And I got to do something that I have missed terribly for a year, and that is worship in a community of people. And there is, you don't, you don't, see, people got church all wrong, and that's, and that's why people are leaving the church because they don't, no, what we live in a consumer society, a materialistic society. People go to church to get something. And, you know, what, what do you hear all the time by people that talk about church? They say, well, I went to church, I didn't get anything out of it. Yeah. And like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You <laughs> you went there for all the wrong reasons. You go to church to give something. What you go to give, and I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about you go there to worship God, to give God glory. That's absolutely right. And people, you know, not everybody, but a big majority of people have the thinking backwards about church. You know, they yep. no, it's one thing to take something away. Like, okay, wow. I learned something in that sermon today, but yep. you go there to give. Um, and it's a lot of people do have that misconception and also about the church going back Gosh, I haven't been to a physical church in a long time, but people have a misconception. The church is the people, not a building. But there is a yep. difference. You still need to meet up with people. You know, you can only do virtual so long. You de yep. you de The body needs to come together at some point in time. Yep. And this, the way I see COVID, it's not just COVID. I see this as a test of faith and, you know, the whole church community. Because there's a lot of people, I just read this article the other day. They were saying, like, I think it was a third, I forget what percentage, had quit going to church completely, even virtual. And it's like, uh, it just makes no sense to me. I know it's it's meant to happen, but are they just giving up? Because I'm like, you should have just give up like that. That's not what church is about. It's it's about your yeah. connection with, and your relationship with the Lord, you know? And it's, yeah. Um, yeah, being virtual is hard. We all get that. We're all going through it. 
But I'm like, you know what? God's not forsaking and leaving us behind. So why should we just give up? You know, we shouldn't. It's a test of faith. Um, There is a power in being in a community of faith, worshiping, praying, singing, listening to scripture, listening to preaching. There's a power there that if you open yourself up to it is life changing. Oh, indeed. Um, and I don't, I, um, I don't know how to get people to try it because you, you don't know, you will not know what I'm talking about until you go and experience it. You know, it's like, um, I love Paris. I love a lot. Of, I love uh, the Holy Land. I've I've been to a lot of places. I I was in Kenya um, doing evangelism and mission, and um, I love Kenya and I love Central America. A lot of places I love. You can't explain to anyone what it's like to hang out in a Mayan village in Central America with Mayan people, unless they go and experience it. And that's why I took. Um, hundreds and hundreds of people on mission trips to Mayan villages in Central America. I did 27, did 27 mission trips to this village in um, Central America, and I'm still working with them, matter of fact. Wow. Um, and, you know, how can you describe a Mayan person, the Mayan personality? It's It's different than us, and it's beautiful. And sometimes it's kind of frustrating because I didn't understand our differences, but over time I began to understand them, you know, and love them the way they are. Oh, indeed. You know, I can tell you one thing, Howard. So I was in the military and, uh, um, I served a total of four years, not back to back, but four years over in Baghdad. And, um, something, you know, I try to get through to people that, you know, the world is such a big place and I've been to, oh gosh, I've been to Asia, Middle East. Well, Middle East is Asia, but, and they've been to yeah. Europe too. Um, and it's like, well, you don't want no one to experience war. You know, that's the last thing you want someone to experience. Yeah. But the thing I try to get through to people is, you know, until you're, you go and see these different cultures or way of life, you won't understand. You can't just turn on the TV and expect to know it. You, you may learn background, but you're, until you're in it, physically in it, you won't understand. Um, and what amazes me, Howard, and this is beyond f- amazing. So when I was in Iraq, the, you know, the, the Middle East is, as we know, a huge um, Islamic population. But you have your Christians there. You got multiple uh, faiths, but a lot of them are underground. And yeah. here's something that blew me away. I did not know this, but there were a couple Iraqis that worked on base, really great individuals. They, they were Muslim their whole life, and they— uh, Jesus actually physically visited them and in an instant they were transformed. Cool. I love it. And they, they told me there's so much of that happening. You don't hear about it, but it's happening nonstop. So Jesus is making impact, not just in the middle East. He's doing it around the world. He's doing it on his watch, you know, for reasons it might not be instant, but he's doing it for a reason. But just hearing those stories, no, see, God has not gone anywhere. He's still working, and he's working on the people that who really need him. Um, yeah, the most, and that are seeking because people in the Middle East and a lot of other places are very spiritual and very religious, but a lot of them are seeking still. And when they ask, um, a uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, just show yourself to me. Whichever God you are, show them. You know, show yourself to me. And when they say that, like in a matter of time bam, Jesus shows him, himself to them. And, man, I was, like, yeah. bawling. I, I got chills in a good way when they told me that. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. he's always working. So for us to just, you know, not gather or just give up like that, it's like, man, do we need to be strong? Because, you know, Jesus doesn't give up on us. Um, Yeah, I just found that fascinating. I just had to share that. Yeah, no, thank you for doing that. I've had... um a similar experience with a Muslim man. Um, it's amazing. He was a member of Al Qaeda. He was a Pakistani guy. Wow. Yeah. Well, even some people don't understand, you know what? 
Yeah, they're bad. They're terrorists. But you know what? They're humans just like us, and anybody can be changed. Anybody. Yeah. No matter how and hard God it loves might be. All of them. Oh, God loves every person, even the worst people. God loves. You know, it's just they're lost. Yeah. They're lost. But well, Howard, it's been an honor. Sp- There's one thing I want to get to oh, get yeah. in our conversation before we come to the end, and that is some. Um, so I asked Jesus, what did he want me to do if I had to come back to this world, which he was telling me I did. Because mm-hmm. I wanted to go to heaven. I, mean, I want to be in heaven forever, but um, Indeed. he said, no, not now. And he said, love the person that you're with. And I said, yeah, okay, got it. But what do you want me to do? And he said, and that's what I want you to do. So I had a big argument with him. And he, the bottom line, and I won't go through the whole argument, the bottom line was he said that, Loving is going to change the world, and that's God's plan, and it's that simple. The big plan is that we need to um, expose ourselves to being loving. And when I say expose ourselves, the problem with loving is it makes us vulnerable. And sometimes the reward is just tremendously successful and joyful and great. And sometimes it's um, people reject our love and, um, you know, uh, put us down. So being, being loving is not, is not all, uh, you know, peaches and cream and sweetness. And <laughs> um, it, it can be tough. I've done um, some prison ministry and it was incredibly rewarding. But I want to tell you, when we were... Um, sitting in our small groups with the um, guys. This was a maximum security prison in Ohio. Mm -hmm. These were um, some really rough guys and they were in a maximum security prison because they had committed um, felonies upon felonies. That's how you got there. You know, I mean, they were, they were rough guys. And after spending a week with these guys, we found so much love. At the, yet, I told my wife this and she was horrified. At the end of that week, at the end of that five days with these guys, we were all hugging and kissing each other on the cheek and telling each other that we loved, you know, I'd say, George, I love you. You know, Ronnie, I love you. And they'd say, Howard, I love you. And I mean, these, these, are, these are some really scary boys you know really scary <laughs> I bet and, and I told I told my wife that and she was horrified wow and she was like you didn't do that and I said no really these are beautiful beautiful men and I love them and they love me and this oh, oh she said this is gross and I said you don't understand you don't understand <laughs> well you know what a lot of folks in prison or in jail yeah they might be crazy but you know once you get deep down into their soul you realize, yeah. you know what? They're seeking what we're seeking. Yep. They've and just you, made some really bad choices. <laughs> oh, that's absolutely really true. Bad. And you know what? You may have nothing in common with them, but when you finally connect at that level, everything starts blending together. Yeah. And like I said earlier, you know, the big, the big, they just want to be loved. Yeah, you know? that's true. That's absolutely true, Howard. And I, it all comes down to what you just said, love. Yeah. Everything is about love. Jesus, God, I mean, everything is love. And this is a, like the thing that sometimes I don't understand about Christianity. You know, Jesus in the Gospel of John, he says in his um, final talks to his disciples just before he um was crucified and died and buried and resurrected. He said to them, this is my commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. That, that's the, that's Jesus in a nutshell right there. Love one another. That's you know? it. And at yeah. first it's, everyone's like, oh, that's easy. But you realize, no, it takes a lot of work. You know, loving. Yeah, is- I've, been work- <laughs> yeah, I've been working on it for 35 years and I'm s- still an amateur. I'm know? an amateur with you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. an amateur with you. We're all amateurs, but you know what? I mean, the way you're going right now, the way I'm going is how it's meant to be. Cause God always wants us to be seeking him. And yeah. because if, if we finally got it down pat and we know what to do, then that would kind of throw God out of the equation. And he doesn't want that. 
So we're always yeah. going to need him until the end. Yeah, so, absolutely. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you, Howard. I mean, you're you're one great individual to talk to. Um, your message is very important, and I appreciate you sharing it with me today. Um, well, thanks a lot, Elijah. If anybody wants um, to connect with me, I got a website, howardstorm.com, and there's a contact thing, and that uh, email comes right to me. Okay, so howardstorm.com. I appreciate it, Howard. Yeah. So that was Howard Storm. What an amazing story. Amazing story. Um, you can check out his links below in the description. And his website is howardstorm.com. Uh, you can check out more information about him. Or just go to Google as well and search for Howard Storm. Um, very fascinating topic. So thank you for joining me today. And we'll see you on the next episode. For now, I am Cyber and I'm out. Peace.